How's it going? Um, so this is the first time I'm giving this talk, and so I would love your feedback. Uh, so if at the end you want to come up and, and uh, ask me questions or point out areas that might be better, uh, I would love to hear it. So um, please don't hesitate to talk to me afterwards. Um, so my mission here today is to kind of talk through a multitude of complex topics and try to get them down to very simple concepts to help fill in a bunch of gaps um, that you probably never had to think about, or many of you may have never had to think about. This is a lot of the stuff that I personally learned uh, in college and while at Google. Um, and like, I think nowadays we've abstracted so much of this stuff away that most people don't have to think about it, nor should you really have to. Um, but there's some benefits to understanding the entire uh, way the internet works. And so I'm gonna do my best to try to describe that today. Uh, so this all started when I was talking to uh, a friend and mentor, um, my friend John. Uh, he's the, uh, he was a former EVP of, or he is a former EVP at Twitch, and he was one of the first network engineers uh, at YouTube. Um, and he said, tell me how a web request works is literally the first question I've asked in every technical interview I've ever given. And when I thought back on it, like every interview I've ever had to go to, I've had to answer that question myself. Um, most of the time it stopped sort of at the surface level of like how a web request works. Um, and, and you know, increasingly, uh, over time, I started getting more and more curious about how it works all the way down to the electrical level. So that's what this talk is about, and, and John was the person who inspired me to do this. <clears throat> so why is it important? Well, um, first and foremost, uh, it gives you some opportunities to identify performance areas that are areas of improvement from performance. So when I was doing a lot of my performance work on some of the stuff at YouTube, like the video player, and uh, Feather, uh, and a bunch of other internal projects. Um, having some of this insight was very helpful for identifying where things were gonna break down performance-wise. Um, it also helped me make smarter decisions about compression and optimization and when that makes sense. For instance, you, know, you might you, you want to compress your images, but you don't want to gzip your images when you're sending them down the wire. It doesn't make sense. Um, it also helps you triage and debug network-related issues, recognize security vulnerabilities and attacks, um, get a sense of where your costs are, and it helps you communicate with other engineers. So uh, I'm sure all of you, uh, many of you work with other kinds of engineers, like software engineers, uh, network engineers potentially, depending on the size of your company. And, and you know, if you're working inside of data centers and stuff like that, uh, you may have to operate with electrical engineers as well, which is, is always interesting. So this is the only bolded list in this entire presentation. So let's get started. So. Here is your simple browser window. I'm sure you're all very familiar. Uh, this happens to be Brave. I use Brave, I like Brave. Uh, not an endorsement per se, just that's why it looks a little bit different. Um, and we have a URL plugged in, and we're gonna load an image. So you type in a URL, usually it's a website. In this case, we're gonna do an image because we're gonna keep things very simple. Um, we're going to do just basic HTTP. We're gonna load a single image, um, and we're gonna, you know, keep everything to its most basic, just for the conversation that we're having here. You hit enter, it starts to load, and then you get an image, right? Um, so a lot of things have to happen to make that image show up. Um, and I'm sure, you know, at the very onset, you're probably very familiar with the stuff that I'll talk about initially, but maybe not as familiar with the stuff I'll get into as this progresses. So every web request begins with a URL. Uh, this is our URL. It answers three simple questions. What kind of request is it? Where am I gonna send that request? And what is it that I'm requesting, right? Pretty basic URL semantics here. And those map into these components of the URL. Protocol, network location, path, and query string, right? And so this seems pretty familiar to everybody or anybody who's working in the web. Um, nothing too earth shattering here, but these are the the components that go into actually making an HTTP request, right? So here I've mapped them in to a standard HTTP GET request. We're just gonna talk about GET requests today um, and the responses that come out of them. Uh, again, hopefully this stuff provides the guideposts into other kinds of requests and other kinds of protocols if you're interested in such things. Um, but right now we're predominantly focused on, on web development uh, or web developers and HTTP requests. So this request gets sent out on the internet. So our browser takes that URL, constructs a request object, or request, or request, sends it on the internet, gets a, re a response back, 
processes that response into an image and then shows it in the browser, right? Again, um, probably not that earth shattering yet. So we're gonna keep getting progressively deeper into this as we go. So that cloud is the internet, and right now I just have this amorphous cloud. It's pretty uh, cliche to have a cloud, but that's how we're gonna treat it. But really, the internet is just a collection of networks that connect clients to servers, right? At the end of the day, there's a one server who's answering that request that I made for that image, right? And we gotta find our way to it, right? So the way we do that is by hopping between networks. So we have our Wi-Fi, our Wi-Fi is connected to our IS, or we are connected to the Wi-Fi per se, our Wi-Fi is connected to our ISP. Uh, there's um, components like routers and, and servers and proxies uh, operating in all of these different circles. And we find our way to the next one in the, um, in the network to get us closer and closer to our server that's gonna answer our request. So um, there's a whole science around internet routing uh, and, and how routing occurs. But the goal is to get to a minimum number of network hops, right? Each one of those little uh, orange arrows is a network hop, and we want as few of those as possible to be as fast as possible. And sometimes that may not be possible because of different issues happening in the world, like maybe a uh, network is down, uh, an internet service provider goes out for some reason, and we have to route around it. Uh, and so we can get variable amounts of hops uh, depending on uh, what's happening on the wider internet. But the nice thing about this is that your Wi-Fi network only really needs to know about its ISP, its connection to the ISP, and then the ISP only has to know about its connection to the wider internet, and the, you know, it gets uh, more and more abstracted away from your original client uh, when you start making the request. So that's the power of the internet. The, your, your computer doesn't really need to know more about the internet than its connection to its Wi-Fi, and then the Wi-Fi controls its connection to the further internet. Uh, and that keeps going up and up the chain. So to actually perform a request, we just need three things. We need a network connection, so our connection to our Wi-Fi, per se, uh, an IP address, which is a unique address, or is, a, is an, ad an address, not necessarily uh, unique globally, but or I should say, it is unique globally, but uh, in subnetworks, it can be uh, any number, uh, and a port. And so when I think about these things, I think about these things in terms of almost like a, an envelope that you're, you're mailing, right? So if you're, gonna, if you're gonna draw that analogy, the IP address is the street address, the port would be the uh, apartment number uh, of where you're, where you're mailing things. Um, and one thing that I wanna make sure I just draw attention to is that we don't actually get an IP address right away, we have to look up that IP address using something called uh, DNS. And that DNS is sort of like, if you were to say, if you were to prepare an envelope to hand to your mailman and you just wrote on it, Paul's house, right? it would, wouldn't get to Paul's house. The mailman would have to ask who's Paul, right? Uh, and so that's what um, we do here. We ask a DNS server, where's assets.imagex.net? It gives me back an IP address, and then we can go out on the internet and find our way to the server that answers that, that IP address. Um, and when we have these ports, the ports are actually where we're gonna send data through. So when we get to that machine, to that server, uh, the data is going to be funneled into this port, which in this case is port 80, which is the default port for HTTP. So we're really just connecting a client to a server and making sure the ports align so they can actually transit data back and forth between them. And the way we do this is by creating a connection. So we create a TCP connection. TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol. Um, it starts with something called a handshake, a three-way handshake, which basically goes like this. Your, your machine, your laptop, says, hey, I'm interested in sending you some data. Um, the server says, okay, I hear you're interested in sending me some data. I'm interested in sending you some data. And then your computer says, cool, I'm ready to accept your data as well. So we now have negotiated a three-way handshake. Uh, and that is done using these uh, small amounts of data called packets. So then we actually get to send our web request, which we'll describe how that actually happens in a little bit, uh, through that connection. So we've established a connection, we encode our data that we need to encode, and we send it through that connection over the wires, over the internet, onto the other side to where the server is, and the server picks it up and routes it to whatever web server is running on that server. And then it responds 
cool, 200 OK, I have it, and here's all the data that goes along with it. So packets start streaming back to your computer, and then when your computer is sending back acknowledgments saying, I got those packets over time, right? And then when we're done, we shut it down. So we, we do a four-way teardown where we basically ensure that we're closing out these connections. Now, it's important to note that in current versions of HTTP, we tend to keep connections open because we want to keep those connections open to do more requests through them so that there isn't, uh, so we don't, aren't spinning up and tearing down these TCP, con TCP connections frequently, uh, which is a performance benefit. So I'm going to digress a little bit as we get into some of the more advanced stuff. Um, so when we're, what we're talking about is actually navigating a network stack. And to do that, we, we typically talk about these things in terms of abstract models. And the most common one is the TCP IP model, which I've been talking through so far, um, at least the first three parts of it. So there's the application content, which is like the HTTP request, which we designed a little bit, or we, we demonstrated a little bit earlier. There's the TCP, which is the transport protocol, which is about like how, what do we do when we get to that machine on the internet? Uh, the IP information, which is how do we get to that machine on the internet? And then the network access, which is how do we reach the internet to begin with from our computer? Um, so they're pretty basic, and they map into these effectively. So if you're familiar with the different protocols, like HTTP, it's a get and a post and a bunch of other data. Uh, get, post, delete, head, all that stuff. Um, transport, uh, we're talking about ports. So port 80 is the typical port for HTTP. Uh, and on the internet, it's the IP address. Um, and then on the network, it's actually a MAC address. So if you've ever had to debug your, your router, um, you're probably working with MAC addresses. And they actually deal with the following things. These are, the, these are what they're actually dealing with. So the application la layer, we're talking about dealing with data. This is like, like we demonstrated earlier, the web request is a, ser is a, a bunch of data that we're sending through the wire. We're planning to send through the wire. That gets converted into what's called sequences, um, which then get broken down into packets, which then get wrapped into what are called frames, and then they're turned into bits that are served over an electrical wire, right, or a fiber optic wire. And so we're going to talk through that whole part in a little bit. So we have the sort of implementation model on the right there, TCP IP model. Uh, and then the one that they sort of, they, they teach sort of in the abstract in the academic circles and, and when people are kind of talking about it, um, like if you're talking to network engineers, they'll, talk, they'll typically refer to things in terms of the OSI model, uh, which has a few more gradations there, breakdowns. So they break the application layer into application presentation and session, um, transport and network are basically the same, and then data link and physical, where physical means literally copper wiring or fiber optic cabling. And so the reason I bring that up is because you may, over the course of your careers, um, hear people refer to things as like L7 or L4. Um, so like L7, L4 represent different layers of this OSI model. So it's a lot of the flashy new um, load balancing software technology and stuff like that, or security protocol or security technologies will, will say like, this is an L7 compliant load balancer, or we block traffic at L4. That's all they're talking about, is like where on this networking stack are they blocking that traffic or, or load balancing that traffic? And that can be pretty important because the higher up in the, the stack you get to, um, you know, the more uh, complicated it becomes. So going back to our, our examples, or back to our, our, our request, the internet is intrinsically state stateless. We send a lot of information around, but there's no guarantee it's ever going to get there. We don't know what order it's going to come in. Uh, we have to do a bunch of extra work to get it to carry its state through the internet for us. So that means a lot of duplicate um, information has to be packaged in with our, our request. And so I'm going to demonstrate that now. <clears throat> so this is our web request. This is a byte stream. Um, it's just our web request laid out. Uh, with different ind indices. Uh, you can see that there's some control characters in there, which are new lines and carriage returns. And we're going to basically, this is what's getting sent over the wire. In fact, it's not actually getting sent like this. It's encoded using the, into binary and all that kind of stuff. But we're going to talk about that later. So the first thing we do is we break it into chunks, right? I, I did this with 16-byte chunks. Um, the actual 
amount varies depending on what the availability is of, of how much buffer space you have and all this other stuff. But for the example, for this example, I've cut it into 16-bit chunks or byte chunks, um, and we've got 10 of them. And those chunks are actually given in a sequence ID. Uh, so that gives us the ability to reorder them, put them back into order when they land on an eventual machine. And that's really important to the next, to, as we go through this whole thing, because that's where the state starts to come from. Our request has to be reassembled on the receiving machine, and sometimes these don't make it, right? So we have to re-request a sequence. We have to say, like, we need, we're missing sequence 64, let's resend it, or have your server resend it. And so that's like the crux of, of what we're doing is we're gonna, we're gonna build out a bunch of these. Uh, we're gonna turn these sequences into what are called packets and eventually into what are called frames. So the first thing we do is we put the data down. Um, the sequence is, is part of the, the headers of the transport layer. So the first thing we do, and you can see these map into those, those uh, TCP IP uh, versions. I've color coded them so they match with the original TCP IP model. So the transport headers get appended or prepended to the data. So you can see we've got our get, part of our get request. We have our sequence ID. We have a couple of ports. We have our destination and source ports, which tell us what, the or what we're going to do when we get to the machine, uh, the actual server, like what port we're going to talk to, where the web server lives. Um, and then there's a bunch of other data that I don't have in here. There's things like CRC checks, which are cyclic redundancy checks, which verify that the data actually is what it says it is. There's no errors in the data. Um, another interesting thing about this is the sequence number is actually randomized at the beginning. That way someone can't guess what the sequence number is and try to insert their own packets in there. It's kind of cool. Um, there's a bunch of stuff like that happening, a bunch of, of technical nuances that make it possible to do this and do this securely um, that I've kind of excluded from this particular window because we're just trying to keep things a little bit simple. But if you're interested in these things, then there's plenty to read about in terms of how this actually works. But for the most part, what we're interested in is the, the ports and the sequence ID. Um, and then we go into the internet addressing part where we put our IP addresses. So we have our source IP address and our destination IP address. And then we go one more level. and We put our networking MAC addresses around this. And this is what actually gets sent over the Wi-Fi or over the wire or the fiber optics. And what's interesting about this is these are like envelopes inside of envelopes inside of envelopes, right? So at any moment in time, we can unpack an envelope and repack it in a new envelope. And so that allows us to like change where things are being routed, you know, as they're going over the internet because the IP address you start with may not be the IP address of the, the destination of the next hop that you're on. So you may have to like change these things around and that's what the whole internet routing thing is. They package and unpackage these uh, as deep as they need to go into where they are in the stack. So um, that's basically how that works. And the biggest size, the biggest size of that whole thing at the bottom is 1,526 bytes standard. So that means that when you remove all the overhead, you only get about one kilobyte per packet, right? Or one, one kilobyte per frame of actual data that you get to send on the wire. So when you're talking about like a massive JavaScript file, say, you know, 500 kilobyte JavaScript file, it's gonna have to be cut up into about 500 um, packets. So you pay attention to that because the fewer packets you use, the more likely it will be to not require, it'll be more reliable, it'll be faster, it'll require fewer uh, hops per packet, or not fewer hops per packet, but fewer total net hops uh, over time. So this is why I spend a lot of time on performance because to me it's really important to get as few uh, as much data down the wire as fast as, or as much information down the wire as fast as possible without any extraneous data. Because every one of those potential hops and every potential um, packet could be lost at some point. And that just incurs uh, latency. So that final frame, that has to be encoded into binary and then sent over an electrical wire. So we're going to talk about that, but we're going to start going in reverse. So. Uh, we're going to start by talking about the atom. So um, these are electrically conductive atoms uh, that I modeled in Keynote. Uh, they're not particularly, not particularly advanced, but what we have there is a nucleus. It's the, the blue part. Um, and then I have just one electron. Um, and so that's because 
in, in electrically conductive atoms, there's one electron in what's called the valence shell, which is the outermost shell of an electron. Um, if you don't know uh, how atoms work, there are, there are uh, neutrons and electrons, um, and the electrons orbit the neutron, and uh, uh, they can only, only so many of them can fit into each shell. So they start out with a few, and then they get bigger and bigger, and then you can only have, like, or I'm sorry, they, they, you can only have a certain set in each uh, shell, and then in this case, when they're electrically conductive, they have one electron in its outermost shell. And that's how we get electricity, and I'll tell you how in a second here. So by adding poles with positive and negative charges, so electrons are negatively charged, and they want to move towards positively charged poles. We cause one of them to break off, and it flies towards the positive end, which could be the positive end of a battery. Um, it could be you know, the positive end in your electrical socket or whatever. Um, and then that causes a chain reaction where the other atoms start pulling their uh, electrons from you know, the ones behind them, and then the negative terminal actually picks up and provides additional electrons into this circuit. And what we have is an electrical current, right? So it starts flowing. Now in the next one, I've actually removed the, uh, the atoms themselves and just shown the electrons. So we have a bunch of electrons flowing through a wire. Uh, the electrons are all flowing the same direction because this is, this is direct current. This differs from alternating current, which goes in both directions over a time period, so it just kind of swings back and forth. Um, but in direct current, which is what your computers use and what um, batteries use and all that kind of fun stuff, it goes in one direction, and the rate at which it's going is called voltage, right? And a higher voltage, so let me go, there it goes. A higher voltage means more electrons flowing, right? And what's interesting about that is we can vary that over time and then we can set a clock cycle on that. So imagine if these are moving and you have one point that's just reading them every you know, microsecond or whatever the actual amount is, we can get a sense of, um, we can create basically binary data, right? So that's how you go from an atom to a bit is by creating a threshold and saying, you know, at 0.05 volts, this is, this is gonna be a one and anything below 0.3 volts, that's gonna be a zero. You know, and that's how you get to binary data. And then binary data can be converted into numbers and text. So, um, yeah, that's basically, I, I don't know if the people have been exposed to this stuff, but um, this basic binary of converting into a number from a binary string or a, a byte, which is eight bits, um, or looking up uh, how an ASCII character code works, which I don't know why, but that one looks like it was made in like the 1960s. Uh, I couldn't find a better one that was a high resolution. So, um, but so we've now talked through um, how all these like things come together, and there's just a tremendous amount of data flowing. So much data, in fact, that there are over two trillion gigabytes of data will be transmitted on the internet uh, next year. Um, to me, that's a staggering amount of data, right? And it's all going through what I just showed you, right? Um, it's going over electrical wires and fiber optics. It's using the, those packets and, and frames and all that uh, networking that I've tried to give a baseline overview of. Um, it's going to take a ton of electricity to do this. Uh, in fact, they're predicting by 2030, um, in, the nor in the base case scenario, or the expected scenario, uh, we'll be at 20% of all electricity on the planet will be uh, dedicated to this stuff. So uh, one thing that kind of shocked me is that the carbon emissions related to doing that uh, surpassed the airline industry in 2015. So this is something that I like to think about because we spend a lot of time talking about performance and cost, right? Um, these are areas that I particularly specialize in, um, but also that performance uh, and, and or the, the electricity and the computation that we do is actually creating a lot of emissions as well. Um, and it surpassed the airline industry three years ago, four years ago. So I was kind of surprised by that. I mean. We see a lot of headlines about Al Gore flying to Davos on a private jet, um, but we don't, aren't seeing as many headlines around carbon emissions from the internet. And to me, I find that pretty interesting. Um, and I think, you know, I think it's important that we actually like do our part and use fewer bytes whenever possible. 
Um, so obviously, like, that's what I've put, spent my career is, is on getting performance and, and getting down to fewer bytes. I think it's, you know, worth thinking about, even though, you know, you know, getting your JavaScript file down on your personal portfolio is probably not going to contribute that much. But there's many of you who either work for or will be working for some of these larger companies like a Google or a Facebook where you do have control over some of this and you can have a major impact. And to me, that's like really important to think about is like how can we keep our data down because we can actually like help, you know, maybe cut some of those electrical costs a bit. I know at our company, we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a month on electricity effectively, you know? And so like anything we can do to cut that down uh, benefits not only our costs and our performance, it also benefits potentially the world. So there is like actual importance to understanding this stuff and how it impacts not only your business, but also the world we're in. So um, if you liked this talk, I want to recommend a book. I have no reason uh, this is, I'm not like a super endorser over this person or anything like that, but this is a book I read way back in, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. I highly recommend it. It explains the insides of a computer effectively. So it's what I was, I've been trying to base this talk on is to try to get to the level of, of this particular book in terms of being able to communicate effectively uh, how some of this stuff works. In this particular case, this is like CPUs and, and memory and uh, all that kind of fun stuff. So if you're interested, check that book out. I highly recommend it. Thank you.